Okay, here we go. Um, so what's new? Generative Q&A with Amazon Q in QuickSight. Um, I'm Chris Elliott, um, and thanks again, Maddie, for the introduction. I'm a senior product manager on Amazon QuickSight, focusing on our AI and ML tools like uh, Q. So today we'll go over um, Amazon Q, um, what it is and what it enables for you and for your business users. We'll talk about named entities, which is a concept within Amazon Q, so what they are and why they're important. We'll talk about uh, topic authoring and some best practices there. So topics, if you're not yet familiar, are sort of a data asset similar to dashboards and reports that power um, ad hoc Q&A. Um, and then I'll do a live demo of some of these capabilities um, in our product. So first and foremost, um, what is Amazon Q in QuickSight? So Amazon Q all up um, is a new uh, suite of natural language tools available throughout AWS. And Amazon Q in QuickSight is specifically for asking ad hoc questions on structured business data. So if you're familiar with the existing QuickSight Q, um, this is sort of a fundamental reimagining of that product. So we have a new suite of natural language processing models under the hood, and we have a completely redesigned front end uh, for end users to ask questions. Really what we wanna do is enable business users to come into Amazon Q and QuickSight and be able to ask ad hoc questions about their business data using their own words, uh, just like they would uh, talk to a peer or anyone else in their organization um, and get rich answers in in return. So you can see here I've asked for revenue by customer for chatbot plugin where uh, maybe that's a product in my data set. Um, and I do get the literal answer to this question in that bar chart there in the middle. So that's uh, sales by customer filtered for chatbot plugin. But I also get multiple other visuals to help ground me in the data that's available. So I get my total sales. I get my total number of customers. I get a scatter plot of a couple of my key measures grouped by customer. I have a table there at the bottom that's a preview of my named entity, which again, we'll talk about in just a minute. And then I have a narrative summary of the data uh, on the left. Um, and this is powered by Amazon Bedrock. So this is now in public preview. Um, if you are a Q subscriber, then you can opt into the preview. Uh, the preview is at the user level. Um, so you'll have to do this uh, individual users in your organization. And when we get into the product demo, I'll show you how you can do that. So let's talk a little bit about named entities. And some of this is gonna be a little abstract and it'll become clearer once we actually get into the product demo, but just to sort of tee it up. So what is a named entity? Um, it's a group of fields from a data set, and these fields represent sort of a business concept. So, for example, when your business users think about customers, it's unlikely that they literally just think about customer names. They probably think about other things that go along with customers. So, for example, perhaps it's account managers or the internal stakeholders who oversee customer accounts. Um, the days on books or sort of the tenure of each customer um, in your organization. Uh, the number of active users each customer has and then maybe revenue that that customer has brought in. So when business users uh, think about customers, they sort of have all of these things in mind, or they might have questions about all of these things in mind. You know, again, they're not just thinking about, you know, literal customer names. So why are named entities important? Um, well, they provide Q with the context of field relationships. So we're able to say that account managers and these other things go with customers, whereas other fields in my data might not go with customers. Um, it might be that my data set is very wide and I have uh, other business data that's included. Or it could be that my other fields are things like artifacts from my ETL pipeline, maybe different timestamps or things that um, just shouldn't be considered when I'm talking about customers. So it helps focus uh, Q on just the relevant fields when answering questions about customers or whatever else. Uh, you can have multiple named entities in a topic, so whatever other concepts you might model via your named entities. And then it helps Q leverage these relationships to create those rich multivisual answers that we were looking at before. So let's take a look at a concrete example. If I had uh, no named entities in my Q topic and I came in and I asked this question, how does response time vary across account managers? Well, I am able to get an answer to that question, um, you know, sort of like we were seeing before. It's the literal answer to this question. It takes the you know, response time in days, groups it by account manager, and then I get sort of a stack rank of all the account managers in my data set. However, if I have a named entity that's modeled to show me more data about account managers, and I ask this exact same question, then what I'll see is, again, uh, the answer in that bar chart, but then also these other uh, multiple visuals to sort of ground me in the other data that's available and the other data that relates to account managers. So I didn't explicitly ask for the other things that are on the screen here, but Q is able to provide them to me based on what it knows uh, from having uh, the named entity configured in the topic. So let's talk about some best practices before we dive into the product demo. 
you know, so first and foremost, and this doesn't just apply to named entities, it applies to sort of all the things that you'll see that we can do with Q topics. Um, but really, this is a matter of working backwards from your business users. So what are they curious about? And how do they talk about those things? What are the words that they use? Um, where are they sort of using shorthand to refer to uh, uh, complex uh, concepts about their business, which is probably very frequently? Um, where does their language diverge from the field names and values that might exist in the physical data? And sort of, uh, you know, how can you create that translation layer between uh, the data sets that you're familiar with um, and the ways that your business users are used to talking to each other and used to asking questions about the data? Um, you know, start small and scale out. So rather than thinking about this as bringing in all of your data sets, into a topic at once and trying to answer all the questions that your business has. Um, think about it sort of the other way. So gather the you know top 10 to 15 business questions and the variance of those questions from throughout your org. So what are the most common things that people are asking about and what are all the different ways that they're asking about them, the different ways they're trying to pivot that data? And how can you configure a topic to answer those questions robustly and reliably? Um, once you have that and you're sort of able to answer um, the top questions and address the top needs, and you can scale out to additional stakeholders from there. And then finally, you know, there is an element of continuous improvement here. So ultimately, you know, authoring a topic and maintaining a topic for Q&A should be less work than maintaining a dashboard or a report or many dashboards and many reports. Um, but there is, you know, still some work to be done to make sure that your topic is able to answer the broadest uh, array of questions that it can. So within a topic, which we'll see, um, you can see uh, user activity in terms of questions asked about your topic and how they were answered and where there might be areas of improvement or where users seem to be struggling versus what's working well. And then, of course, just engage with your stakeholders or your top users to understand um, how the topic can better meet their needs. Okay, so let's jump over to the product. I'll stop sharing this and... Okay, I'll share my browser. So let's start from the quick site home. Um, first and foremost, like I mentioned, um, these features are in public preview and the preview is at the user level. So if you're a, a Q subscriber, then what you'll see when you come into quick site, if you go over and click on your user icon uh, uh, and then go to preview manager, you must see a toggle for preview Q generative capabilities. And that's what uh, turns on um, the new generative experience for Q&A. There's other things that uh, other features that come along as well. And when we um, send out the slide deck, I'll be sure to include uh, uh, launch materials about all the things that came out alongside uh, this release. Um, but that is what turns on the generative Q&A capabilities. So now I'll navigate down to topics. And very briefly, if you have um, uh, existing topics, if you're an existing Q customer and you already have topics, then the way that you can leverage generative Q&A on those topics is by navigating to any one of them and then clicking on this convert topic button. And what this does, you'll notice that the primary call to action here is duplicate and convert. Uh, so just for context, um, we will create a copy of the topic, and then that copy will be the generative experience. And we do that because we don't want you to, uh, you know, come in and click on convert topic and have that immediately make changes for all of your end users. So we make a copy first. You can then uh, curate it, uh, create your named entities and curate it to meet your needs, um, and then share it out with your end users um, once you've got it uh, working adequately. Okay, so let's navigate over to... Uh, my topic here, which is marketing effectiveness, where we'll we'll spend our time today. So if I go over and just show you a little bit about what's in the data, um, so I can see a list of all the fields uh, in my data set, um, and I have the ability to press a lot of metadata about this data, uh, again, to sort of model it based on what my business users are expecting. So for example, here I have this field, which in my data set is lead account manager. But that's not really how my business users refer to it. Um, you know, they might just say account manager. Or they might even just say AM um, as an abbreviation of account manager. And so I've modeled a synonym here so that when someone comes in and asks questions about AMs, then we know the field that they're referring to. There's other things that I can do, such as including and excluding fields. So one example here is lead ID. If I expand this and just show you a preview, this is just an alphanumeric identifier um, that is tagged to an individual lead. And it's not really something that is important to my business user. So it's in my data set. 
And it would help me do things like if I'm an analyst, then this might be a field that I would know to count when I'm trying to find a count of um, leads. But it's not something that my business users are ever going to ask about explicitly. So I've actually toggled this field off um, so that there are other things about leads that my business users might ask. Um, but when they're asking those things, Q shouldn't uh, focus on this field lead ID when generating the answers. I also have a calculated field down here for net profits. So just like when I'm authoring dashboards and reports, I can create calculated fields in my topics um, to express additional data that might not come in in my data set. And this is just a difference of revenue and cost. So a fairly simple example, but I can model that here in my topic as well. Okay, so let's try asking a question on this topic. Oh, and I guess I should mention, um, starting from scratch here, I don't have any named entities yet, so we'll walk through a couple of different questions and how I can uh, create named entities to better support those questions. So I'll start with something like, um, how did response time vary across AMs or account managers? And what you'll see is that similar to the slides we were looking at before, I don't have a named entity here. My question is still answerable. Um, so I get a stack rank of my account managers by the time it takes them on average to respond to um, an individual uh, lead or impression. Um, but I don't have any other data uh, around this. So this is, you know, I guess a correct answer, um, but it doesn't help me go any further than just this very literal answer to my question. So let's create a named entity around account managers and see how could um, a little bit more context questions like, like this. So I'll go in and add a named entity. This is going to be um, AM details or just some details about account managers. So I'll add account manager name, of course, um, and then maybe a couple of metrics about account managers. So we were just asking about average response time. I'll also include, uh, let's see, total impressions maybe, and then total conversions. So I can sort of see uh, how many um, conversions uh, uh, based on every uh, based on how many impressions um, account managers are, are able to convert. So I'll go ahead and save this. Close out the named entity editor. And I'm just going to ask that same exact question again. So how does response time vary across AMs? And now because response time and account manager are both fields in that named entity, it's a very strong signal uh, for Q to um, isolate that named entity and use the fields and the relationships between those fields to create this multi-visual answer. So again, I do have that literal answer to my question, um, just like I did in the single visual uh, template version of this. But I also have um, other as well. So I have uh, two KPIs, uh, my overall average response time and my total number of account managers. I have my key metrics grouped by account manager. I have my entity preview, which I can expand to see individual records in my entity. And then I have the narrative summary, which is made possible by Amazon Bedrock. So let's go ahead and uh, create another named entity. Um, you can have, again, multiple in your topic. And so now, um, you know, in addition to account managers, I'm also interested in uh, campaigns and how my campaigns are performing. So I'll create one for campaign details. I'll include the campaign name, uh, conversion status, so I can see, you know, in each campaign how many uh, impressions are converted versus not. Um, I'll take total leads per campaign, and then I'll also get a net profit to see, you know, uh, how much um, revenue minus the cost of the campaign uh, came in for each campaign. And I'll save this. And one thing I didn't show before, even from right here, as I'm making changes to my named entity, I can always view in queue. And what this does is it launches um, the named entity in queue as if I was an end user and I had just asked for this named entity or in, 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 uh, in their heads, it might be this business concept, which is campaign details. That's all I wanna have to ask about in order to get uh, rich data back that sort of describes my campaigns or my account managers or whatever the concept might be.
So if all I did was come into queue and type the name of a named entity, then I would get something like this. So in this case, the template is just a little bit different because I have different types of fields in my named entity. So I have two dimensions and two measures, whereas in the account managers entity, I have one dimension and three measures. So here I have a bar chart, which is a stack rank of total leads, my top measure by campaign name, which is my top dimension. I have the total number of leads and the total number of campaigns. And then here I have a Sankey, which I can actually see um, for each campaign, um, how well were they generating conversions versus not. And I can also see um, right off the bat that I actually have a pretty good uh, conversion ratio here as compared to not converted. This is a pretty tall bar. Um, and again, I have my entity table and I have my uh, narrative summary um, via Amazon Bedrock. And business users can get here relatively easily as well. So if we navigate back out to the queue landing page, there's a couple of things that I have, uh, some tools that I have to navigate the data without even having to ask a question. So as a business user, um, you know, perhaps uh, queue is new to me. The concept of topics is certainly new to me. And so I get here and, you know, I might have questions in my head, but I'm not exactly sure what I can ask about. So there's a couple of things that we do to make it easier to ground business users in the available data. One uh, is first just to show the date range for which this data is available um, so that you know sort of the timing of, of the data that's uh, behind the scenes. Um, we have suggested questions, and this includes um, AI generated questions. So when you first create your topic, um, we actually scan your data set and we come up with questions that we think might be reasonable based on the data that's available so that you don't have to do any heavy lifting before your end users can come in and just start asking questions and just start exploring the data. I can show you a little bit more of that in a second. And then I have what's in marketing effectiveness. So the name of my topic is marketing effectiveness. And here I can explore um, uh, the entities and the fields that are in it. So I have my two um, entities right at the top here. I can click what's in the data and get just a tabular representation. So I'm sort of aware of the fields and um, I can look at individual records to sort of ground me in what's in there. Or just like I was showing from the authoring side of things, I can just click on the named entity name. and I can get a multi-visual answer back in return. So we provide these uh, ways, uh, these tools as ways of uh, for business users to navigate the data that's in the topic, get familiar with what's in the topic and get confident that the types of questions that they want to ask will be able to be answered by the data that's available. Okay, so just a couple of things that I'll show on the authoring side. So I had mentioned user activity and sort of having your finger on the pulse of what your end users are trying to ask, what's working well, what's not working well. And so I can see that here. Um, I can see all of the, uh, well, maybe we could think of as sort of the organic questions that I asked where I was actually typing something in. And then I can also see uh, each time that I just clicked on a named entity or just asked for a named entity. And so I, as the topic author, I can view these things and I can see exactly what my end user saw. And so I'll know, you know, um, how well the words that they're trying to use to ask their questions are being mapped onto the data that's available. And then we had also talked about suggested questions. So this includes both author verified and AI generated questions. Let me give you one example of author verified. So I, as the author, um, you know, let's say that this, I expect this to be a common question um, amongst my end users. Um, I can ask it. I can make sure that all the visuals are, you know, look as I would expect. I can make sure that all the fields are mapped as I would expect. And then I can click mark as verified. And what that will do um, is make it so that when my end users come into queue, in that list of suggested questions that we had um, on the landing page, they'll be able to see the questions that I've officially, you know, quote unquote, sanctioned. And so they can start from those, you know, known um, answers um, that are, you know, known to be um, representative of common business concepts. And just another way that we provide for authors to be able to help business users ground themselves in the data that's available. And then lastly, with my AI generated questions, as I'm going around and making changes to my topic, so for example, I was showing um, adding synonyms, changing field names, creating calculated fields, um, including and excluding fields, et cetera, et cetera. You can go in and regenerate these questions periodically to make sure that they're always reflective of the most up-to-date uh, data. 
And you can also um, hide them from suggestions um, if uh, uh, you'd like to, if you uh, would not like AI generated questions to be available to your end users for any reason. Okay. So that's really what I want, wanted to cover today. Um, you know, just emphasizing the importance of named entities and of working backwards from your business users to really make uh, Quicks IQ successful. Um, but ultimately, you know, letting uh, sort of the power of Q's um, natural language processing models do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, and um, getting your end users uh, rich in, in contextual answers back to even the most vague questions that they might have.